Now let's hear from four different data teams about how they're handling the growing importance of machine learning in their products and systems. We'll be hearing from companies in healthcare, energy and utilities, and software. Our opening speakers are from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois. They will describe how they use MLflow to gain a comprehensive end-to-end -end view of their machine learning projects. Please welcome Derek Higgins, Senior Director of Data Science, and Sonia Waksmonski, Senior Data Scientist of Blue Cross Blue Shield. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending this uh, virtual event. I'm Derek Higgins, Senior Director of Data Science at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois, Montana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. And I'm here with my colleague, Sonia Waksmonski, who's a Senior Data Scientist in our Enterprise Data Science team to talk a little bit about best practices and not so ideal practices for organizing all the artifacts that go into a data science project. The background of this is that uh, Sonia and I have uh, led data science projects at a number of different organizations with different standards and cultures, a lot of them large enterprises that present, present uh, particular coordination challenges. So we have uh, some more stories in terms of uh, how things are often done and ways that teams can improve their practices. So for those of you who are not super familiar with the health insurance space, we are one of a number of so-called blues, health insurance companies under the Blue Cross Blue Shield umbrella that operate in different areas of the United States. We in particular are a not-for-profit insurer and the largest customer-owned insurance company in the United States. Of course, we are interested in controlling costs with the aim of keeping our members' premiums low, uh, but our not-for-profit status allows us to take a broader view of our work as well to support the health of our members and the communities in which we operate. So like any data science team, ultimately we're um, tasked with solving business problems. And some of the questions that need answering for, for insurers or payers as we're called to solve our business problems are, are those that are on this slide. For example, uh, what can we do to improve health access and outcomes for local, local communities? What healthcare provider is the best fit for a member given uh, the needs that they have, their plan type, their location, and so on? Which of our members are at high risk for adverse events in the near future? And what can we do to help them avoid those? Uh, and when requests are made for insurance reimbursement, are they legitimate? Are they matched to the medical need? A lot of these questions are, are matched to modeling or analytical activities, which is where we come in. So for example, fraud detection is an analytical activity that's associated with ensuring the um, legitimate uh, nature of billing. Um, we might do modeling to uh, estimate a member's likelihood of uh, being readmitted to the hospital after they're released. Um, we might uh, build a recommendation system to match uh, members to providers. Um, that's basically our, our reason for being around. Now, the first area where we've seen some challenges in designing and maintaining data science project repositories is in getting a comprehensive view of the entire process from end to end. So I bet a lot of you out, of, out there have had a conversation that goes a lot like this one. You're working with another team that provides you with a data set, uh, and you see something weird in your, in your data stream. So you reach out, hey, can you tell me whether something changed with a particular variable, last visit date, how is that being calculated? And they might say, oh, you know, we made some updates, um, but we don't think we did anything that could change your data stream. So, you know, okay, well, how do you follow up from that? Can you share that? Can you tell me exactly what was done? And maybe um, the, the team member uh, who, who, who did that work will email you at some point, but it's really, it's really frustrating, right? So changes are happening that affect your work, but there's not really an easy or immediate way for you to get insight in, into exactly what they are. Similarly, you might have downstream consumers of your work who embed your results in visualizations or other systems. So I've definitely run into situations where the results don't show up the way I would expect, uh, and it's hard to track down exactly what that disconnect is. Now, a major cause of this issue of fragmentation of code and resources is the fragmentation of work across teams in larger organizations. Many of you have probably heard of uh, Conway's Law, uh, which says that any organization that designs a system defined broadly will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. So if your company has a data team and a data science team and a front end team and an infrastructure team that supports all of them, any given system you work on is likely to end up with four different code bases, each with its own library of supporting resources. And of course, this leads to lots of problems. So bottlenecks in work that involves coordinated, coordinated changes across teams, and an inability to reproduce processes end to end and ensure that they function as intended. And once this kind of fragmentation exists, 
it can be really difficult to address. So we want to get to a situation where different teams do their work transparently and other teams have immediate insight into it, where they can identify a specific version of any code they depend on and ensure that they're interoperable with it. But it's hard to decide on a single platform or framework for sharing across teams because teams use different tools and they're not always in a position to quickly adapt to somebody else's tool chain. And of course, if there is no code for their part of the process, it's just a manual uh, set of steps that somebody has to do, then you run into a whole different set of problems. Of course, it would be great if all the teams involved could just put their work into a single place, a single shared structure, one shared project repository in GitHub, or a single shared Databricks project. But it, we run into problems there that uh, I just mentioned. So uh, related to the, the technical proficiency and tool chain across teams, related to politics and so on. Um, an alternative uh, might be to have projects for each team, potentially in different um, repositories, but with the possibility of linking to specific versions across teams. So the, the coupling is looser, uh, so it might be easier to achieve, but of course it still requires a certain level of technical sophistication in that each team has to be using at least some sort of, of versioning. If neither of these is viable near term, then the least we should try to achieve is some sort of manually maintained links between projects. So documentation in each repository about any upstream dependencies and downstream consumers and links to the best information we have on code locations and maintainers. Uh, and with that, I will turn the floor over to my colleague, Sonia. Okay, so Derek just talked about the importance of centralizing our code and our work pro product across an organization. Now I'm going to talk about how we use these central repositories to store an important part of our output, which is the analytics decisions we make based on our data. So what do I mean by analytics decisions? As data scientists, we often write code that has these hidden configurations and parameters embedded inside it. This includes things like model parameters, how we filter and pull our population, thresholds we put on scores and outputs, and decisions we make about how we're going to aggregate our data and return results. Oftentimes, these parameters are not given to us nicely by the business. Instead, they come from research that we've done on our own data. For example, observing that an age, age, age has a certain distribution and we set thresholds based on that. This is what makes programming for data science different than general software engineering. As data soft scientists, we often start by exploring our data sets in an ad hoc manner and understand what we have and what's missing. And then we move on to build the code that goes into a reproducible type pipeline for scoring and modeling. This analysis that we do can take many forms. It can include standard modeling steps like a correlation analysis. We review variables for trends over time and fill rates. We also spend time understanding our database data models or just trying to learn stories from our data and understand more about our business and our end users and the problems and stories that they have. So I've spent many years working on projects and inheriting code written by other teams in various formats. And I've learned that it's really necessary to treat this exploratory work we do upfront as a first class work product. This means that it should be saved and documented and memorialized for future readers. So that if we need to explain or debug these embedded configurations that appear in our code, then we have a starting point for our research. Sometimes I will go back to my own EDA work that I've done six months ago and I review what I've learned and that will save me hours of research understanding a problem. So this is an example of a notebook written by a data scientist on one of my teams and he saved his correlation analysis and wrote, gave a nice write up about what his decisions were. And now I have something that I can use to explain uh, if I need to why particular features were dropped. So he saved this in a notebook with clear descriptions of his results. So as Derek mentioned, there are multiple options for shared work environment. GitHub supports notebook rendering, um, checking in notebooks into GitHub. It also has the advantage that it's pinned to your code. Uh, the Databricks environment also supports a shirt, has a shared notebook workspace, and this makes it a very easy and quick to share work and results with teammates. Um, it, it can be shared even when teammates are working in different clusters. So now let's talk about the next phase in the data science lifecycle, which is building the model and storing all the outputs and results of that modeling process. So this is also a place where uh, it's important for our work to be organized and reproducible and transparent so that we're mindful of who will inherit our work uh, in the future. So usually when we start modeling, we work in a notebook. So this is an interactive environment and it's easy and it allows us to debug and review our work and make do visualizations of our results. But the downside of, of our work in a notebook is that it's only local scope. When we exit, we only have the notebook output, uh, output. everything that's in memory goes away. So we can show that we have a successful method with our notebook, but we don't have a model that we can deploy and use to score future data. 
So this, off, this is often what happens when we go to productionalize a model. So here's an example of a copy and paste of coefficients from a logistic regression model. Um, so I think that everyone who's worked in insurance has done this at least once. Um, and this way of productionalizing your model is fine if you have a GLM, but when we move to machine learning methods, we need an alternate approach. Specifically, we need to save hyperparameters from our experiments. We will need to save serialized model binaries. We need to save our test metrics that show we validated our model. Um, and we, we may need to store uh, other arbitrary artifacts like charts, for example, an image of an RUC curve um, uh, or additional data sets, for example, something we want to label and analyze. All of this that we save allows another data scientist to rebuild our work and continue where we left off when they need to. Uh, MLflow offers a way to track all of these artifacts. We can do this with the Python API that can be called directly from our model, modeling pipeline. Uh, MLflow ML will support storing uh, hyperparameters and binaries and metrics, as well as our other arbitrary artifacts. So here is an example of a grid search that I did in MLflow with Databricks. And what you can see that I have here is a way to review all the, the hyperparameters hyper as well as metrics results from across different folds. Uh, my results are stored in a central location in a consistent way so that I can review them and others on my team can review them. MLflow also supports a model registry that will support model versioning and will show uh, which experiment and pr produce a particular result. So as with everything we've discussed, our goal here is to store our work in a way that's clear and transparent, it's available to other data scientists, and it supports people on our team as well as others who are going to inherit our work in the future. Thanks, Sonia. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed this uh, survey of some of our thoughts about uh, particular ways of organizing projects, uh, best practices, and some things we've run into that are not so optimal. Uh, just so you're aware, this is a, a brief version of a longer talk that we're going to be giving at uh, Spark AS Summit. Uh, so patterns and anti-patterns for memorializing data science project artifacts. I hope this has whetted your appetite and we will, uh, you, will, you will join us uh, for that talk as well.